Hello and welcome to another episode of The Defenders on Sunset TV. And in this episode, we are going to look at the very interesting innovations and path-breaking innovations that have been carried out by India's premier research and development agency for defense, that is the DRDO and its affiliates. We are going to look at both air-to-air -air or air-to-ground missiles that do not require a visual contact with the target. They are beyond visual range missiles. And we have learnt about some very unusual close quarter battle techniques and technology that has been invented in this country that allows soldiers to engage terrorists and insurgents without coming into frontal contact with them, but from a particular angle where you can preempt the intentions of the terrorists and the insurgents. And we have two very well-informed scientific personalities. We have Professor Dr. Selva Murthy, who is now the Chancellor of the Amity University in Chhattisgarh, but also former DGDRDO and their technical research initiatives. And we have with us Mr. Sudhir Kumar Mishra, ex CEO and MD of the very well-known BrahMos Missile and Aerospace Program, which is now being eyed by many countries across the world who want to buy this technology from India because of its path-breaking results. So welcome on the show, both of you, sir. I want to start with you, sir. Now, DRDO has been claiming that the complete transfer of technology has been achieved in the case of the Astra missiles. You know about Astra missiles much more than I will ever. Please explain that missile system, but answer a crucial question. What is transfer of technology? That means has this technology come from abroad and we've assembled it or we have completely indigenously manufactured it? Thank you very much. First of all, let me congratulate the Defense Research and Development Organization, the scientists, technologists, and all the stakeholders, industries, academia, who have contributed to whatever we are going to discuss today, the Astra missile. Astra missile is a air-to-air -air missile. It is from a fighter aircraft. You can launch a missile to go and hit another air airborne target. It could be an aircraft. It can be a drone. Normally, it's a f another fighter aircraft or an ad adversary. So it's an air-to-air -air missile. As was rightly mentioned, it's a beyond visual range. So you can re look at the range up to 100 kilometers. Now we are looking at 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers range. So you can detect an object, be a fighter aircraft, coming at that range and then hit. The other important factor is the velocity at which this missile moves. So what is the speed of the missile? Here, we are looking at a supersonic and close to hypersonic 4.5 Mach. That is the speed at which this missile moves because the fighter aircraft moves also at a very fast velocity. So you have to chase and then hit. So this has a range as well as the velocity. Then the next important thing is the warhead. So how would you kill the kill power? So reach and kill. So it has also got the warhead which can kill that object which we are, or the target which we are looking at. So the Astra missile took almost uh, close to a decade to develop because it, it needs a very high technologies like materials, propulsion, control, guidance, navigation, weapon system integration. So all these are technologies which go into this. So we have been able to develop. It runs on a rocket motor. And so that it doesn't give a bloom or the smoke which will be detected which will help the enemy to detect the, uh, the missile coming over there. So this also has a co electronic counter-counter measures so, so that the enemy radar cannot detect it. So it has got a fantastic missile when you compare best 
of the, such a kind of air to air missile this stands out in, in terms of its uh, velocity or the speed and also the altitude it can be op, uh, it can work at an altitude of 20 kilometers so that is if you fire that from there you get 110 kilometer range but if you are able to also have a higher range that is the mark 2 and mark 3 what has been technology transferred what you mentioned a technology transfer <clears throat> from the DRDO to an, our industry is actually a design, developed, and also uh, all aspects of technology with indigenous, indigenization is now going to the Bell, uh, the BDL, that is Bharat Dynamic uh, Limited, which normally manufactures our missiles. And also, it is, uh, we are, uh, this, this that uh, the BDL will be the manufacturer. So technology transfer is we transfer the know-how, the engineering drawing, the process, and quality control. All this which was indigenously developed by DRDO is now getting transferred to the manufacturing agency. So in this case, it okay. is BDL. So very, very detailed and comprehensive, sir. And I'm much clearer now about what the DRDO's particular achievement in this path-breaking missile system is really something we have to be very proud of. Uh, Mr. Mishra, you were heading an organization which produced a missile which we are extremely proud of, the Brahmos. Thank you. Now, how is it that what the Brahmos was achieving or is set to achieve both in land, air and even maritime uh, configurations how is it that the Brahmos technology was not made available for Astra since it took Astra about 10 years to manufacture, since you had already created a missile system which could do a lot of the work that Astra does? Or is Astra one level ahead of what Brahmos was capable of achieving? Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Uh, actually, both are different class of missiles. Okay. Uh, one is uh, the Brahmos is uh, anti-ship land attack missile and uh, Astra is uh, air to air missile. And uh, although there is a commonality that uh, both missiles use uh, Sukhoi 30 as a platform, uh, but in case of Brahmos, uh, the target is uh, ship and land when you launch it from Sukhoi 30. And uh, in case of uh, Astra, it is uh, another aircraft. It's basically a air uh, offensive and defensive missile. And uh, Astra is uh, completely indigenized uh, other than Seeker. Uh, initially, uh, we uh, imported a Seeker from a friendly country. And uh, later on, we have uh, undertaken the indigenization program. And uh, as of now, Bharat Electronics Limited, uh, they are the manufacturing agency for this. Uh, coming to the technologies, there are some technologies which are common. Like uh, when you integrate a missile onto an aircraft, uh, the launcher has to be designed and uh, then you have to carry out uh, electrical and mechanical integration of missiles with the platform. And uh, then we have to carry out uh, captive flight test. And uh, we have to also ensure that aircraft is uh, certified to take the missiles in flight. So uh, these were the commonalities. And uh, in case of Astra, uh, Astra weapon system, mm -hmm. uh, we have used uh, the weapon suite, weapon control suite of uh, Sukhoi 30. Mm -hmm. uh, but in case of uh, Brahmos, we had to devise a separate uh, weapon control system. We call it a peripheral control system. And uh, that is housed in the launcher. In case of Astra, it's not so. <clears throat> we are using uh, aircraft uh, weapon control system and it's a very sleek. That's how you see the launcher uh, completely, uh, you know, un invisible to the eyes. Okay. There is okay. one more thing, one more difference. Uh, in case of Brahmos, it's a quite heavy missile. Uh, it's almost uh, 2.4 ton. Okay. And uh, we use uh, a drop, uh, drop launcher. Uh, but in case of Astra, we use a rail launcher. It's a pretty sleek and uh, it's not very heavy. So it's a rail missile. And uh, in case of uh, Astra 1, Astra 2, uh, we would be continuing with the rail launcher. Uh, 
uh, but in case of Astra 3, which is under development, because the weight will be more, uh, we are looking at both the options, uh, drop as well as rail launcher. Oh, uh, the very, commonality ends here. Oh, very, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, just a quick question. Why is the Brahmo so much heavier than the Astra? Uh, you see, what happens uh, in case of Astra, the weight of the warhead is very less. And uh, what happens so when you are attacking a incoming enemy aircraft, uh, you use a proximity fuse. I mean, you need not hit the aircraft. The missile, when it is in the close proximity of enemy aircraft, it explodes. And even if a fragment uh, weighing uh, 50 grams, it hits the enemy aircraft, uh, the mission is met. But in case of Brahmos, uh, the warhead is uh, pretty high. It's uh, close to 2,000 kilogram of TNT. And uh, the target is a land target uh, and uh, ship target, which are, uh, you know, almost uh, 4,000 tons of steel. So uh, you need to have a very heavy missile. And uh, uh, there is one more thing that uh, the BrahMos is a supersonic cruise missile and being a supersonic, it needs a booster as well as a sustainer. So uh, both are heavy because the booster has to take the missile to a certain speed, uh, close to 1,800 meters per second. So uh, the booster takes the missile within eight to nine seconds up to that much speed and then sustainer takes over. Sustainer oh. takes it to almost uh, 1,000 meters per second. And uh, then uh, that these are the reasons uh, the Brahmos is much heavier than Astra. I'll come back to you about uh, issues related with Brahmos and how the world sees it. Uh, but Dr. Selvamurthy, <clears throat> it is said that after the Balakot strikes and the Pakistan responses thereafter, led to the F-16 knocking out MiG-21. It's a well-publicized story. It was not such a great achievement on the part of the F-16 to knock out a MiG-21, which is at least 30, if not 40 years older mm -hmm. than the F-16. The gallantry of Captain Wing Commander Abhinandan notwithstanding. Why is it, why is it that it was argued that while the Sukhois could have been deployed to counter the F-16s, the MiG-21 went in. One argument, it was closest to the area where the F-16s were coming and therefore the quick reaction and determination of the pilot. But is it that before Astra has come into our inventory, our aircrafts had nothing in terms of air-to-air -air counter to what the Pakistanis fielded? No, this is, Sastra is actually the indigenous air-to-air -air missile, but Indian Air Force had the... Russian made. Yes. Right. Missiles, but their capability in terms of strike range, as well as the warhead and the speed, velocity, all these are much less. So today you are talking about 4.5 plus Mach and also the, uh, the range of 110 kilometers if you mm -hmm. can fire the missile from an altitude of 20. Mm -hmm. And then also the electronic countermeasures. The other one is you can operate in two modes. That is autonomous mode as well as buddy system mode. That means you fire the missile from a fighter aircraft, maybe Sukhoi or any other fighter. And then you can guide it to a multi-target situation that you can go and hit any other target, you can give, guide this missile to another target as well. So, so these, it can hit more than one target? Yes, so there's a multi-target tracking as well as hitting. So this capability is now available indigenously. So the question is, it is the Air Force, they have to take a decision on that. It's an operational question which you asked, that why it was not deployed at that time. The, as you rightly said, maybe that the closest the aircraft available was that, so at that the, you at get the base, the speed. At, at the, the base, exactly. With the base. Okay, so uh, Mr. Mishra, I want to understand, and you had an interjection to make, so we'll ask you to make that first, and then explain to us why the Brahmos has become so popular in demand overseas and what we are looking to do in terms of exporting that, because that could be a model that could be applied to the Astra also. Okay. Uh, 
very uh, intrusive question. You see, the Brahmos uh, basically is a joint venture between India and Russia. And uh, our Russian partners, uh, they have uh, earlier versions of Brahmos, uh, which they can uh, easily market. Uh, Brahmos uh, having a headquarter in India, uh, we are a kind of a neutral sellers. And uh, there are many countries like uh, Philippines, Indonesia, or uh, uh, many countries in the ASEAN region. Uh, they feel very comfortable in uh, talking to India, strategically speaking. Yeah, more so now. More so now. And uh, uh, we took advantage of this situation. And uh, let me tell you, Today what you see that uh, only there is one customer Philippines uh, but we worked very hard for the past uh, six years uh, to export it. We participated in several exhibitions, uh, brought here many foreign delegations, visited their uh, Ministry of Defenses and uh, we found that uh, it's a big blockade. Uh, India has never been a weapon exporting nations. Uh, you see, exporting uh, smaller things like uh, small weapons or uh, uh, body armor or, uh, you know... Uh, Boot and bayonet. Armaments. Uh, it's a very different thing, very small thing. But exporting weapon is a, it's a very big game. And uh, uh, it's not only that you supply and uh, you forget about it. There is, uh, you have to maintain it for the for the. 10 years, 15 years, after that you have to go for life extension. So any country which buys Brahmos or for that matter any other missile, they are in your uh, customer book for at least 30, 40 years. And uh, people were looking at uh, Brahmos that it's a stable company. Uh, we have also supplied to Indian armed forces. You see many nations, they look at the supplier's credibility. Uh, they really get impressed when they realize that uh, Indian Army, Navy, Air Force, both, all three forces have inducted it. And uh, apart from this, we have been participating in the various international exhibitions for the past uh, 24 years. And uh, we have uh, displayed our uh, product, uh, we have clarified the doubts, and uh, that's what has uh, resulted into the export of Brahmos to Philippines. Okay, very I'm interesting. I'm not at liberty to tell you more names, but mm. many mm. more names you would be able to hear in coming one or two years. I believe Vietnam and South Korea have been very interested, but you will not comment on that. That's fine. But I know the world is interested and that is a tribute to your excellence. Uh, but thank you for giving clarity on that. And I've always been an advocate for years that <clears throat> if we can buy top-end technology, why can't we export? And the whole argument that our security will be compromised. Our security is anyway compromised by buying technology from outside because mm -hmm. the guy who's made it knows what he's giving you exactly. and he pass on the secrets to anybody for a price. But that's a separate issue Maruf of Bolna. Maruf sir, I would like to correct uh, one thing here. Actually, in the case of Brahmos, we have never imported the technology. We have jointly developed it. That is why the intellectual property, uh, what we develop, uh, it's ours. What Russians have supplied, it's theirs. Uh, what we have jointly uh, developed and uh, integrated, demonstrated, that becomes a joint uh, IQ. No, I am with you. I'm not talking so, about, I'm not talking about taking technology from outside in the case of Brahmos. Yeah. I'm saying that after all, the Sukhoi fighter is of Russian origin. Yes. After all, our ships and aircraft carriers were until now of Russian origin. Many of our submarines have been of Russian and other German origin. Uh, Tanks, again, we know the story about Russian tanks, T-72, T-90. So, I mean, there's a whole, Brahmos is a case apart. But what I'm saying is, if you can get technology from outside, you can also join the arms fray. This is, I'm sorry to say, it's a Nehruvian baggage. That it's immoral to export, but it is moral to import. Yeah. But that's a subject of a separate debate. Dr. Selva Murthy, uh, need to understand from you a bit uh, about the corner shot weapon. The corner shot weapon, as I understand, is something that you are going to engage people in built up area or thick forested area and you are expected to know or see the adversary, but the adversary should not be able to see you to be in direct engagement with you. Therefore, 
it gives you the first uh, mover's advantage and therefore it compromises uh, the terrorist or the uh, insurgent on the other side. Like in 2611, uh, there are cases of very gallant fight put up by our people. Uh, there is, um, I think Major Uni Krishnan was the officer who got hit by a direct engagement by the terrorist in the Taj Hotel. But if a corner shot weapon of the sort had been available, then a direct engagement would have taken longer to happen. It would eventually happen. Please explain. Right. If you look at the evolution of war today, see we had high intensity like world wars and then mid intensity like Indo-Chinese and Indo-Pak. But then now the war scenario is low intensity conflicts like what is happening in Jammu and Kashmir, as you rightly said, the jungle uh, warfare. And so these are the order of the day, which will happen maybe for another couple of decades. So, but then we have to protect, defend our soldiers and protect our soldiers. So for which survivability, sustainability, mobility and kill power, these are four things which you need to give it to the soldier. So if he has to survive in urban warfare, like what happened during the terrorist attack, you need to first save our soldiers from the uh, firing coming from the other side. So we, the far which is a very important uh, development by the DRDO. And they, uh, it, it is actually has got two, two parts. One is the front portion, the other is rear portion, which you can operate it in 70 degree, ang uh, 90 degrees. So you can keep the arm close to the targets, but you are not directly on the uh, visual line of sight. So you can be hiding around the corner but you can still see situational awareness, where the target is, where the enemy is. So this will help you to see. So for which the technologies which have been used there, first is a camera. You should have a day-night vision capability. Then you should have a laser guidance that you need to target mm. with the right kind of laser. If you are operating at night, even though you have the vision, but if you want to light it, you need a flash, which is which is to see the target very clearly and fire. But then in the meantime, the enemy is not able to see you because you are hiding in a corner or a, or a wall or any other barrier. So this helps you to survive and hit with, uh, with a very great accuracy. So this has been developed both as a pistol as well as as a grenade launcher. So you can, these are the two, model, two variants right. which they have been able to develop. This is a great achievement. And two, two industries have taken, one from PSU, one from private sector. The one is Bharat Electronics Limited, Pune. Bill Pune has taken this. It's a defense PSU. It's a great major partner with the TRDO. And then also we have another one is Zen, Zen Technologies, in, uh, Hyderabad. In Hyderabad. So these are, so one you have given to a defense PSU, because you will need large number. Today CRPF has ordered quite a large number uh, to the Ministry of Defense, DRDO. And similarly, the JNK police is now looking at its induction. They are also placed orders. Yes. So I see tremendous opportunity. All the police force may require it over a period of time. So I can imagine the volume. So that may not be available only with Bell, because Bell is engaged in so many other activities, so many productions. So that is why it's wisely given by Ministry of Defense, Government of India, that you have one defense PSU, the other one is a private player, and this is a great policy, which, which is now more private sector coming More into and more production. being adopted by the government yes. in terms of cooperating the private sector with the defense PSU. Yes, it is. And it is path-breaking technology. I'm also aware that the NSG is interested. Yes. And uh, low-intensity conflict has been a subject very close to my heart because I did my master's mm -hmm. dissertation on that subject right. way back in the early 90s when people were not using this terminology right. in India. Right. I I remember that. Yes, I, I wrote about You are about a great it. visionary. No, well, no, in terms I mean, of I just looked ahead and tried to see what are going to be the future patterns of warfare. Absolutely. And uh, it is very convenient to two countries to adopt the type of conflict because even if you look at the case of Pakistan, it gives you deniability. Mm -hmm. It also is a low cost but high impact conflict Correct. scenario. And most importantly, uh, it is something that allows you to be able to fight a war on your terms 
without getting compromised because of the strategic scale of your adversary. But we'll come to that some other day in a private sure. conversation. Mishra Saab, please help us understand that how, in the case of Brahmos, you all were able to come up with such path-breaking and fantastic technology uh, without having secured orders in the first place. Because the model that works everywhere is that you come up with an R&D model and once that is acceptable to a potential buyer, then you go into scaling it up. Now, it's a question that you are often asked by foreign buyers that what is your captive market? If you have a captive market as you brought out, the armed forces are buying it, it excites the foreign buyer into saying if their own people are buying it, why not we buy it? And the same question is not answered very effectively in a lot of other technologies that we make because when we try and look to sell it, people say if your armed forces are not buying it, why should we? It's, it's a very interesting. Actually, uh, what I realize uh, that what matters is uh, the strength of your partner. If your partner is very strong, uh, in case of Brahmos, uh, we had uh, DRDO, we had support of DRDO and uh, NPO Machine Ostronia. And uh, both, uh, they have uh, taken enormous effort to ensure that uh, Brahmos is uh, developed. The required technologies are, uh, they, they are properly funded. Uh, skilled manpower is deployed and uh, we carry out testing and uh, ultimately give assurance to the user that uh, this is a system which you can really rely on. And uh, I will say that uh, uh, the Brahmos uh, engineers, uh, DRDO scientists and uh, NPO specialists, uh, they all three have uh, taken the, uh, the responsibility to give assurance to our armed forces that yes, uh, we can do it. And if you remember the, uh, the 2001, uh, our armed forces, uh, they were also not having many choices. And uh, Indian Navy, they took a real you know, risk by allowing us to uh, integrate missile on their ship and uh, fire it. And uh, uh, before that, we have shown them uh, all the, the, uh, the, we have shown them all the papers, uh, the certification, okay. yeah. assurance okay. uh, documentations, and it has brought a lot of confidence. Okay, so we're terribly short of time, but I think you've answered the, the question specifically. One is you need a strong partner. Two, you need support from the armed forces and greater engagement from the armed forces. And of course, the government's blessings. Government. And, and clearly, I think the time has come for you in particular to write a paper and make it public in what should be the parameters adopted by us to export other weapon systems so that we achieve the target of being a weapon exporter in the long run, which has been spelt out by the government. But thank you very much. I'm terribly short of time. I'm being told I need to wrap up. But until our next episode, thank you for watching and goodbye.